Hi everyone, Adam Steele from Hot Pole Studios here. Uh, a while ago, I did a review of the Audient ID4 interface, which was this tiny little interface that had one XLR input. It was USB powered. It was a funky little thing. Today, we're going to talk about its much bigger brother, the ID22, and all the cool stuff that this can do. So this is the ID22, and this is a big leap up from the ID4. There is another one in the series, the ID14. Unfortunately, I don't have that one to hand, but I'm going to talk about some of the funky features that the 22 can do, because this really is, it's much weightier for a start than the ID4, which it should be. It's got a lot more going on in it, but it's also got a lot of features. It's got lots of uh, ports on the back. Uh, lots of separate switches. Uh, it's got things like it's got dim and cut buttons on the front next to the volume where the ID4 just had a rotary for the volume. This while you're working, this is more of a studio tool than a little interface. Say you're talking to someone in your control room and you've got the playback going, but you just want to talk to them, it's a bit loud. Touch the dim button, brings the level down, or touch the cut button and that'll just cut the sound briefly. It's a nice shortcut to have. It really is in a studio setting where you can just just click cut and go, sorry, what was that? Talk about something, then unclick cut and off you go. And you've not had to do anything in software because a light lights up and you can see it. Sounds so obvious, but simple little things like that can make a big difference. It's also got optical ADAT in and out, which means that at 44 or 48 kilohertz, you can have an extra eight channels going in and out of this unit. Um, it's got two microphone preamps of its own, which are really very clean, and we'll do a bit of a demo of those in a minute. But also, if you include those, if you're not running at the higher sample rates, like 88 or 96, then that means that this is a 10 in, 12 out interface, which if you add those together gives you 22, ID 22. It kind of makes sense. Uh, but yes, the outputs, this has four separate outputs. Now, the first thought you might think is, well, why do you need four outputs? Why is two not enough? Because two is left and right. There are several different applications for having extra outputs. Uh, one, it for me, is that I could use the separate three and four to make a completely different headphone mix for an artist. Or I could have the three and four go into a completely different speaker set. Like you see here, I've got my uh, black box white cone speakers, which are actually not Yamaha NS10s, but they're copies. But by the by, um, I could have that as a separate output, maybe, and just switch between them using one of the function buttons on the front here, which is programmable. Uh, what I tend to use them for myself, though, is I use just one of those outputs as a reamp output, I will use a reamp box from say output three, and I will send a raw, dry guitar DI signal out separately so that that goes back to a guitar amp that's got microphones blazing, and those microphones would be recording obviously into these preamps. And because op output one and two are not being used, uh, they're still the kind of master output from whatever software you're using, so you can still hear what's going on. You can hear that mix in with that reamped guitar, so you don't have to turn your sound off while you reamp things, which would be really counterproductive. I mean, how much time would you waste having to reamp a part, then listen to it, check if it's good, reamp again after changing it, check it again, when you could just do all that live in real time and not have to change any physical connections, not have to change any of that stuff. And I'm going to do a video uh, specifically using an audience interface that's going to come out in a week or two that's about reamping guitars using this method. And that extra output there is the absolute lifesaver. <laughs> Now this has its own headphone output. If I remember rightly, you can change whether the headphone output is a copy of just the standard DAW output or whether it's a mix of uh, the preamps and everything going in 
in real-time monitoring. Uh, that's not a way that I like to work. I like to hear everything coming through the DAW. That does bring you some latency though, which is something that's worth talking about next. Latency. Uh, when I got hold of the ID22 for review, the Audient drivers were on version three. And I have to be completely honest, uh, over USB, I've done a video about USB and latency before. It was nothing to write home about. In fact, it wasn't great. And that can be said of most USB audio interfaces. And even the competitors, like say Focusrite or Presonus, uh, the USB latency can be really quite long and quite annoying and quite off-putting. Uh, up until now, the only uh, manufacturer that I had heard uh, in practice uh, latency that was usable of was RME. However, version 4 of their drivers came out with the release of their new interface, the ID44, which I'm going to talk about in an another upcoming video because I have a one of those uh, that I was sent as well. And when they released that, the number of samples of latency that you could choose went right down. You can choose a 16 sample latency, which is something like one and a half milliseconds each way. It's like a three millisecond round trip. That's bordering on Thunderbolt and PCI Express kind of latency. That's impressive. And at that point, the performance is very much down to the computer that you're running things on. If you've got a slower, older computer, you'll get clicks and pops on the audio because the computer can't handle that. Whereas if you're running something much newer, then problem solved. And that is quite an interesting development for me. Especially since Firewire is essentially dead, your options really are Thunderbolt or USB or PCI Express kind of classed with Thunderbolt. And so with this being USB, that also means it works with iPhones and iPads. So if you've ever seen my videos about using something like the ID4 with an iPhone or an iPad, uh, you can do that as well with this using the USB 2 into an Apple Lightning uh, camera connector, they call it, but actually you can use interfaces as well. So the quality of the sound is identical between a PC or a Mac and an iPhone or an iPad because the quality comes from this, not from the device you're recording onto. So you can get kind of world-class audio now through an iPad. In fact, the drum videos that I did recently, I can't remember if I was using an ID22 or a 44, but most of the channels were using one of their ASP800 preamp banks using the ADA inputs. Uh, and so the whole drum set was recorded on a USB into an iPad. And that just shows how flexible these things are. One of the funky features I've not talked about just yet is there are sends and returns on these two preamps and they are balanced, which is really quite rare. Usually when you see inserts, even on big mixing desk, an insert point comes after the preamp and then before all the kind of EQ and the, the faders and that kind of stuff. And that's usually where, um, it, traditionally with a mixing desk, you would add things like compressors or outboard equalizers. Uh, so then you could have, say, a nice microphone going into a preamp, then because something like a compressor doesn't accept microphone level signals, they take line level. So that's what the preamp does. But then the insert point would send that line level out. You could use something like an 1176 compressor, which is one of the more well-known ones, back in, and then that would uh, record straight through the mixing desk onto the tape. In this case, the return jack goes straight to the analog digital conversion in these, which is really very good. I have heard better conversion than these, but we're reaching. We're talking big money. We're talking thousands of pounds just for the conversion unit for the next step up, if I'm completely honest, because uh, the prices do that, and this kind of unit, the quality is pretty much up that curve just before the price starts to get silly. But what's interesting about these returns is that, say you've got a vintage Neve 1073 preamp or, or something of that nature, if you plug a microphone into that vintage preamp and then take 
a line output from that into the return here, especially if you've got a balanced output on your preamp, that will go straight to the converters here and will completely miss the preamps in the ID22, which are decent, but they're so clean, they have their own kind of clean character. And if you want something else, you can do that without having to double up on preamps, which I personally thought was really quite an impressive little feature, especially having a balanced input to those. That means that you could have two channels of, of really nice preamps and whatever else you've got going on that goes straight to these returns. And Bob's your uncle, you can have the sound of a million dollar recording studio in your project studio. You know, with the, the conversion being such good quality here, you could have a really nice tube microphone into like a Neve preamp into here and then send that to whoever your mixing engineer is and you are going to get some great results back. One, two, one, two. This is the preamp test with the SM7 for the ID22. And I'm finding, actually I'll back off a bit here, the uh, the level's quite decent coming in. It's practically the same as the ID44. I think the 44's got a slightly lower noise floor because with the gain cranked on this, I can just about, if I listen really closely... No, no, the, the, the noise that I can hear is still the noise from these units. That is a very low noise floor indeed, and it's handling the necessary gain for the SM7B very well indeed, which is something I would certainly hope for out of a preamp of this calibre. Back to you in the studio. Channel 2 also has an inbuilt DI here, and I'll do a little bit of a test with a high gain amp. Uh, it won't perform quite as well as having a separate DI box. I always recommend if you're recording something like using a virtual guitar amp or reamping later to use a separate DI box because the quality of the DI there can be so much better because it has so much more space in a separate unit. However, the inbuilt DI is really quite useful here because it is really low noise. Uh, so let's just do a little bit of a high gain here and then just quickly switch in a proper tube DI box and just compare the two. So there's a lot going on for the money here, and that is one seriously solid interface. Let's just find out how much they are quickly. So as of time of recording, one of these is £299, which I'm guessing is maybe $400, that kind of thing. And what you're getting here from all the features that I've talked about is an absolutely incredible piece of kit. And I have to say that I have made the leap now. I used to work with other audio manufacturers and I've become an audience guy. I mean, I've been so blown away by the quality of not just this, but the ID4, which is slightly lower quality, but very, very portable and is incredible quality for the money you pay for it. And the ID44, which I'm going to talk about in the next video, has absolutely exceeded every expectation that I've got. It's jaw dropping. So that is my full recommendation. If you need a two channel interface, pretty much money no object but you need all these features 
get one of these in ID22. Again, full disclosure, Audient have not paid me for this review. Uh, they sent these for me to check out. I'm sure I'm going to have to send these back at some point, although I'm going to see if I can keep hold of one of these. Although, actually, it depends what I, I personally need because having the studio, I really only need one channel at home. And when they sent me the ID4 for review, I refused to send it back. I had to give them some money instead so I could keep it. It was that good. So the only reason I would send this back is if I can't think of a use case for me personally because I already have this. Which, funnily enough, the preamps that I run in here are audience. So hey, <laughs> thanks for watching this review, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. The ID44 video is coming out very soon, as is a video where we're going to talk about reamping guitars using the ID44, actually, but you can do that with pretty much any interface. Then I'm going to talk about how to make an impulse response, an IR, as a follow-up to reamping, because the process isn't that different in terms of the initial setup. And again, that, that's a whole kind of crazy topic we can get onto. So stick around for those and the Raspberry Pi videos and all the other good stuff that we've got coming up on the channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye. Thanks for watching guys. If you enjoyed this, feel free to check out our other videos as you can find here or check out our Facebook and Twitter or our Patreon page, which helps us to make more videos like this. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.